Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 6, excuse me, 16, and reading verses 6 through 8. Acts chapter 16 and verses 6 through 8, and then in a moment I'll read verses 7 through 10. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here tonight, and we pray that you will fill our hearts with joy and gladness, and that you will keep us singing wherever we go. Help us to know with assurance that we are in the center of your will, for that is where the greatest amount of joy and singing takes place, when we know that we're doing what you've called us to do. Even in the midst of distress, as we see the apostles in the book of Acts, going through some very difficult times, and yet are filled with joy and gladness, they have singing and praise in their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you will help us to know with that great assurance that they had that we are too in your will. So Father, we pray for your blessings upon this time tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 16. Macedonia, here I come. Divine direction, part number four. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Do you have that assurance that you know exactly what God wants you to do, you know exactly when God wants you to do it, and you know exactly where and how God wants you to do it? God's word makes it clear that we can know that. We can know when we're in the center of his will. We can know when we're out of his will. And the Holy Spirit will give us conviction of our sin because to be out of the center of God's will is sin. We can't cut it in the other direction. So if you don't know for sure that you're in the center of God's will, if you're not actively pursuing God's will, if you're merely floating through life and sort of hoping that you're bumbling your way to heaven, you're really not in the center of the will of God. It should be an active pursuit as we see the apostles in active pursuit of doing, not just believing, of doing the will of God as we move through the book of Acts. Very important. Now, <clears throat> when we started this study on divine direction, how do we know the will of God when there is not specific scripture at hand? And we noted that the issue is never, shall I obey the Bible or not? The issue is, where shall I do what God has already revealed that I am supposed to do? We always want to ask the question about the will of God when there's not a specific verse on that subject. Like, shall I smoke this cigarette or not? Well, let's see, are there any verses in the Bible about cigarettes? We, we need to start a long time before we ever get to that kind of silly, specific question because God has revealed his will to us in massive blocks of truth as we move through scripture and every one of those has an application to the specific questions that we must ask day by day. We noted here that God never changed Paul's commission. He merely changed his direction and the target people to whom he would be sent, and the same is true for us. God gives us, and we've talked about this in great detail in the past, so I'll just pass over it quickly. God has given to each of us certain spiritual gifts at the moment of salvation, and he sends us to function with those gifts in the body of Christ. He doesn't change our gifts, but he may change our direction and the target group of people, but we are obligated to use the talent that God has given to us. You remember Christ's parable of the talents. We are obligated to use it wherever he places us in the body of Christ. In studying the way in which God gives direction by prohibition, we saw that a few verses before, and freedom to proceed, we learned some very basic ground rules. Number one, God never gives direction that is contrary to his word. You can count on that. 
If you think the Lord is leading you to do something that is contrary to the word of God, it is not God who is leading you, it is the world, the flesh, the devil, or the demons. God never gives you direction for your life that is contrary to the word of God. Number two, God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. Young people sometimes struggle with that when they're on their dates out in the dark, sitting in the back seat of a car in a dark alley somewhere. God never, ever tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. Number three, and we might mention that sometimes when we're figuring our income tax, those of us who are a little bit older, we might be tempted in that direction too. Number three, God never gives direction that is a mixture of truth and error. God never gives direction that is a mixture of truth and error. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said that all lies are from the devil, John chapter 8, verse 44. God never mixes truth with error. So in all questions of faith and practice, what we call the practical Christian life, the scripture is the first source to which we turn. In our text, Paul's on his second missionary journey, so not all the scripture was written yet at this point. So we would expect, and we do, we would expect to find some very clear distinctions and unique features in the way in which Paul received his direction. Don't expect when you go home tonight and you're praying that God will show his, you his will, that in the middle of the night, a vision will appear to you and some guy dressed in funny looking clothes will tell you that this is what you're supposed to do. That's not how God works now. The scripture is complete. It is finished. With the close of the book of Revelation, the canon was closed and God no longer gives special revelation. Although in the text we find that those, those spiritual gifts that deal with revelation, there are seven of them out of the 22, that those seven gifts have been brought to a close because the test New Testament has been completed at this point. Paul had the gift of knowledge, he had the gift of prophecy, but those were done away. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, makes it very clear in verses 8 through 12 that God was going to cancel certain of the spiritual gifts when the perfect, that is the completed revelation of God, was finished. And that has been done for us in the New Testament. We noted that the will of God is that little phrase shows up 23 times in the Bible. And that's where we started our study on the will of God. God wants you to know his will more than you want to know his will. So the broad categories that we've studied on that, where we saw the will of God, were the will of God concerning obedience, concerning service, concerning plans, concerning the divine unity and the Trinity, concerning the life transformation that God is going to work in you, that is, when you present your bodies a living sacrifice that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You need to do that if you want to be in the center of God's will. If you have never presented your body as a living sacrifice, that's a once and for all event. Romans chapter 12 is once and for all. You do that one time, present your body a living sacrifice, which is holy, acceptable, reasonable service to God. Then if you've never done that, you cannot know and discern the specific will of God for your life. You have to do that. Then Romans chapter 6 pops in, which is where you are on a daily basis yielding the members of your body to Christ rather than yielding them to wickedness, to unrighteousness, to sin. The will of God and life transformation. Then we talked about the will of God and the internal fruit of the Spirit. But I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. We saw many places where the will of God related to the exercise of the spiritual gifts. And the will of God applies to all the gifts, not just the leadership gifts. If it is, in fact, the will of God that you personally exercise your spiritual gifts properly, and you're not doing it, if you're not doing it biblically, you're not in the center of God's will. Other broad categories where God has revealed his will included service to other Christians. God has revealed his will on that. Separation from sin and from the world, Galatians 1.4. The will of God and our motivation, we're going to be developing that uh, key a little bit later on. Knowing how to be properly motivated to find the will of God. We saw the will of God in relation to the focus of our prayer life. We saw the will of God, sanctification and moral purity. We saw the will of God in thanksgiving. We saw the will of God in patience, promise, and the will of God connected to that. 
We saw the will of God as it relates to the lifestyle testimony that we give before the watching world. We saw suffering and the will of God, not a very pleasant topic to talk about, but when you understand suffering in the context of the will of God, it not only enables you to grit your teeth and bear it, but it enables you to go through the times of suffering with joy. It might be emotional suffering. It might be physical suffering as a result of disease or an accident. It might be suffering of some sort of political persecution. But if you understand suffering in the context of the will of God, you'll be able to go through it with joy and gladness, as we see many times the apostles doing in the book of Acts. We talked about carnality and the will of God. If you are walking in the flesh, if you're carnal, you are indeed living outside of the will of God for your life. We saw permanency and obedience and the will of God. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So in each of those categories, God has already revealed the starting point at the bare minimum. You can say, well, you know, it doesn't tell me very much. Well, okay, it's a starting point. At the bare minimum, as you look at those different broad categories that we've just looked at, and we studied them in detail over the past three weeks, it gives you, at the bare minimum, a starting point from which to know the will of God in that area of your life. Therefore, in every one of those categories, we know the initial ground rules for the will of God in our lives, and God will never be contrary to the foundation of his will revealed in Scripture in any of those 23 different areas. In each of those categories, God has revealed his will. And that covers a whole lot of the Christian life. Now, last week we added a few more areas concerning that phrase, his will, as it refers to the will of God. First, God's will is sovereign. That should be an encouragement. It's not an excuse to sin. The fact that God's will is sovereign is not an excuse to sin. The fact that God's will is sovereign should be an encouragement in the Christian life. And we looked at the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will. Not just on earth, but in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? What do you think you're doing, God? Nobody can say that. The will of God is sovereign. It's not an excuse for sin, but it is an encouragement to keep moving forward because God will cause his will to be accomplished. Secondly, obedience to the revealed will of God is necessary for understanding true doctrine. Folks, if you don't live in obedience to the will of God that you know, Number one, you will not understand true doctrine, and that means that number two, you will not get any further light concerning his will. Obedience to the revealed will of God is necessary for understanding true doctrine. Obey first, understand later. Jesus said that in John 7:17. 7, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. You have to obey first, and then you will understand. Lots of times our little kids don't know why we tell them to do something and they want to ask why and they want to fuss and whine and pout and cry about it and we insist that they simply do what we told them to do. Heard a wonderful story once about some missionaries who were on the foreign field and they had taught their children to obey immediately. And one day the mother walked out of the house and she saw her little boy standing under a tree. And she said to him in a panicky voice, Johnny, drop to the ground and run as fast as you can. And he did. He obeyed immediately. And as he looked back, a boa constrictor was stretching itself down off one of the branches of the tree. He didn't say, why, Mommy? He would have been dead boy. He obeyed immediately. And folks, that's what we need to do. When we see what the Bible tells us to do, we don't ask why God, we don't question it, we don't try to, you know, spiritualize it away or decide that there must be some other option. We need to learn to obey immediately. Obey first, understand later. The third thing, worship and obedience to the revealed will of God are necessary for getting yes answers to prayer. Now, you're just batting on heaven's brass doors when you refuse to obey 
what God has already told you to do. If you're not worshiping him properly, there are many people who cut out of worship. They decide they can worship God down at the lake just as well as they can with the body of believers. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're moving toward the day of Christ's return. How much more ought we be together worshiping him, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And so obedience and worship revealed the will of God are necessary for getting yes answers to prayer. John 9, 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but, 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 if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Do you want to get yes answers to your prayer? You need to learn to worship and obey the revealed will of God because that is what is necessary for getting a yes answer to your prayers. I think all of us want yes answers to our prayers. Normally our prayers are carnal prayers and so God says no anyway. But if we're praying and we're obeying and we're worshiping him in spirit and in truth like Jesus said we must, then you know what? All of a sudden, our prayers, as they're being formulated, and as the Holy Spirit is presenting them in heaven, translating them, so to speak, into the divine language of the courts of heaven, we suddenly start seeing that God is giving us yes answers to our prayers. James says, you ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lusts, you adulterers and adulteresses. Dear people, Learning to be in the attitude of biblical worship and obeying everything that you know is one of the principal keys to getting a yes answer to your prayers. Number four, knowing and understanding the will of God is only given to the elect. Now anybody who can read English can read a Bible. But the only people who understand it with the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit of God are the elect. Anybody can read those historical passages and say, that's interesting, yeah, David threw out a stone and whacked Goliath in the forehead and Goliath dropped down and David cut off his head. It's not what we're talking about. People can read and understand the English text, whether they're saved or lost. But the only way that you can understand scripture the way God wants it to be understood so that you apply it to your life and so that you live it in response to him as you should is by the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit only gives that illuminating work that understanding to those who have placed their faith in Christ it's very important to understand for example Jews all over the world especially the Orthodox read their Bibles every day. And many of them read it in Hebrew. They see it in the original text. But as we've been sitting on Sunday morning, they're blinded. The veil is over their heart and over their eyes until it be taken away in Christ. So they read it and they do everything they can to place themselves back under the law. And no man can keep the law. We all violate the law in some way. Jesus made it very clear that it's not merely a, a matter of externals when we're dealing with the law, it's a matter of internals. Jesus said, you know, the law said don't commit adultery, but I tell you, anybody who lusts after a woman has committed adultery with her in his heart already. The law said, thou shalt not kill, but hey, anybody who hates his brother has committed murder. When God looks down, if you're trying to apply the law and get yourself to heaven or get yourself sanctified by keeping the law, God says, guilty! Dear folks, knowing and understanding the will of God is only given to the elect. Let me read it to you. Acts 22, 14. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. The God of our fathers hath chosen thee that, or we might say in order that, so that 
You should know his will. Knowing and understanding the will of God is given only to the elect. Fifth, agreeing with the will of God for your life is the foundation for excellence in your life. If you're sort of wishy-washy on the will of God, if you sort of think that, well, the will of God is it can take it or leave it, you know what kind of a mediocre life you're going to live? Agreeing with the will of God, yes, God, I want your will, I see that this is your will, it looks tough to me, but by your grace I'm going to do it, and by, your, by God's grace you can do it, you can't do it in the flesh, but by the grace of God you can do it. I agree with that. That is the foundation for excellence. Listen to it, Romans 2.18 and knowest his will. So we've gotten to the point where we know his will. All these other things are, how do we find it? Okay, now we get to the point where we know his will. Now what's the next thing? And approvest. You're in agreement. Because the will of God is the best thing for your life. The will of God is what will produce the greatest amount of fruit in your life. Doing the will of God is what motivates you with zeal toward running the race to your very best. Do you want that? Do you want to set the world record when God makes it possible for you, you personally, to set the world record for knowing and doing His will? You say, yes, coach. I believe that's the right way to do it. I will do precisely what you tell me to do. Listen, many, many years ago, and you know it's many years ago when you look at me now, but many years ago, I was in cross country, I was in wrestling, I was in track, I earned many varsity letters. I earned 11 varsity letters in high school in those three different sports. Won the Ivy League championship in a good number of them. You know what? It was because I did what the coach wanted me to do. I agreed with the coach. I didn't always understand it. When we were doing a, a special Swedish type of running called Fartlek, where you are, uh, it's fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. I didn't understand some of the things that he was doing, but I mean, he was a skilled coach. When our wrestling coaches told us, no, don't do it that way, you've got to bend more. You've got to thrust more. You get into a grip with your opponent this way. If you didn't do it the way the coach told you to do it, you lost the match. You have to be willing to say, yes, coach, you're right. I agree with it. Listen to the rest of the verse. And knowest his will, that's where we start, and approvest the things that are more excellent. Do you approve the things that are more excellent? Or are you satisfied with mediocrity? You know, as I look around the body of Christ, at least in America today, it appears to me that the majority of the church is satisfied with mediocrity, with just getting by. Now, you know, Paul is writing here at this point, he's talking about what the Jews have done. And so he has the last phrase, being instructed out of the law. He's going to go on and prove how the law merely condemns them when he gets to chapter 3. But they got the first two steps right. It's just that they couldn't see the winning combination, which was Christ. Now, a very important point to make, I've made it in passing, but let me make it directly. The will of God cannot be blamed for our own failures and sins. We've talked about God as sovereign, but that's not an excuse for sin. God is going to accomplish his will, whether you like it or not. It will be done, and it will be done precisely the way God wants it to be done, whether we buck it or not, just like Jonah. We mentioned Jonah last week. Jonah didn't want to do the will of God. God made sure that Jonah did his will. <laughs> it was rather miserable. It was a trip in the belly of the great fish. It was being covered with vomit and being thrown up in a big pile of barf on the shore and still having to go to Nineveh. 
Folks, which is the better way to be in the center of God's will? The will of God cannot be blamed for our own failures in sin. Romans 9.19, Thou wilt say unto me, then, Why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? That's the standard argument that carnal Christians will give. Huh. You know, why does God point the finger at me? You know, I can't resist his will. You tell me he's sovereign. So, hey, let's just sort of live life any old way we want. Who's resisted his will? This must be the center of God's will for me, living a lazy, foolish, mediocre life. No, nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? And Paul gives the illustration of the pot and the potter. How many pots talk back at the potter and say, Look, I don't like the way you're making me. I don't want to be so fat or I don't want to be so skinny as a pot. I want to be this kind of a pot. God makes us the way he wants us for the purposes which he has ordained. Ephesians 1 5 having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You can't blame God for our failures and sins although God is sovereign. He predestinated us according to the good pleasure of his will, which he purposed in himself. He didn't look down the corridors of time and say, oh, that's the way they're going to be, so I guess I'll call that predestination. It's according to the purpose of his will. Verse 9, four verses later, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. You get the idea. How about Colossians chapter 1, verse 9? For this cause also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Not just knowing the bare facts, knowing how to apply the facts that you know. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, about how to apply the scriptures. Hebrews 13, 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Did you know the will of God includes doing good works? We tend in Protestantism to downplay good works. We say, oh, that sounds too much like Catholicism, or that sounds too much like Hinduism, or Buddhism, or Mohammedanism, Islam. You know, good works. Whew, man, we're saved by grace. God has ordained good works that we should walk in them not as a means of salvation, but as a manifestation of salvation. A good work is a work that is done in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the power of the flesh, in obedience to the Word of God, not in disobedience to the Word of God, and to the glory of God, not to the glory of man. There are a lot of human good works out there that glorify man. That's the three tests given in Scripture for a good work. Is it done in the power of the Holy Spirit? Is it done in obedience to the Word of God? Is it done to the glory of God? The three tests for a good work from God's perspective. For this cause also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, that he would make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And there you've got one of the tests right there in that verse. First John 5.14 And this is the confidence that we have in him. Now this is very important. This gets back to that issue of prayer we talked about a few moments ago. How do you want to get yes answers to your prayers? This is the confidence. You're confident about this. You don't wonder about it. You're confident about this. This is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything, don't leave out the next four verses, or next four words. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Do you know how to pray in harmony with the will of God? Well, it goes back to knowing the will of God. And the first place you go is here in Scripture. 
And so you go back to those first 23 issues that we talked about, and we've added uh, six more here of this evening, about the will of God. And you say, how does it fit into one of these categories? What has God revealed to me in that category about his will? Is what I'm praying about in harmony with the principles that God has set down in those categories of his will? And when you do that, all of a sudden you find that your prayers are being tailored in such a way that your heart desires God's will in that category for your life. Revelation 17, 17. God moves in the hearts of the wicked to guarantee that they will end up doing his will. Did you know that? That's what it says here in Revelation 17, 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. God raised Pharaoh up for a specific purpose. Romans chapter 9 talks about that. God had a specific man and woman by whom a specific child was conceived and born at a specific time in history who got a specific education, who had specific character qualities of stubbornness and hardness and arrogance and pride and God put him on the throne at a specific point in history because God was about to work in the nation of Israel. And God says through Paul in Romans chapter 9, for this purpose I raised Pharaoh up that I could crush him and show that I'm the one who has power. That's what we're studying in Sunday mornings. We'll be getting to Romans 9 when we talk more about the plagues and talk about God crushing Pharaoh. God puts into the heart of even those who are his enemies the things that they will do though he is not held accountable for their sin so that he might bring about his own glory and the good of his elect. There's another phrase that shows up in scripture his own will. That of course would very clearly understood as the sovereignty of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. In whom, that's speaking of Christ, in whom, in him, uh, in the beloved. Ephesians chapter 1 uses those phrases over and over again and it's talking about our position in Christ. There is positional doctrinal truth. There is possessional doctrinal truth. Positional is how God sees us in Christ. Possessional is how it affects our living. In whom, that's our position, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and speaking of the apostles in that case and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. James 1, 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. It's not the will of the child to be begotten. And here Paul is talking about, or James is talking about, the will of God which effectually draws the elect to him. The begetting process is the will of the father, not the will of the child. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is the word of God that is the living seed that God puts into our hearts that brings forth life. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now you know last week I explained some basics. Uh, tools that you can use in your own personal Bible study. I explained how to use a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and since last week at least one person went out and purchased a Strong's at a Christian bookstore and showed it to me after church this morning. That's good. But if you have a copy, be sure that you're using it on a regular basis and probably many of you have copies of Strong's and I hope you use them.
and suddenly you're going to find yourself on the way to some very serious Bible study. And when you begin to do that, God will give you commendation that he gave to the Christians at Berea. Acts 17, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They checked Paul out. You can check this preacher out. Check him out. Not with a liberal theologian's commentary. Check me out against the word of God. Therefore many of them believed, also of the honorable women which were Greeks, and of the men not a few. We noted last week that the text included the honorable women which were Greeks. Because of the New Testament doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, that means the Holy Ghost gives insight to saved women and saved girls so that they can apply the scripture in their own lives. Now tonight we're coming to the point where the rubber meets the road, the practical application. The will of God in practical application. Now, we've discussed the Bible as foundational for knowing the will of God. We also need to ask another foundational question if we want to know the will of God for our lives personally. Here's the question. Does this passage apply directly to me in knowing the will of God, or does it rather, one, establish some principle, two, give an illustration, three, show a difference between Israel and the church. Those four things are very, very important. Does it apply directly to me? Does it establish a principle? Does it give an illustration? Does it show a difference between Israel and the church? You're going to get confused about knowing the will of God unless you apply those four questions to each passage that you're studying. Does it apply directly to me? Does it establish a principle? Does it give an illustration? Does it show a difference between Israel and the church? For example, I'm going to give you an extended list from the book of Leviticus here. I'll read a passage, a long passage. So try to answer all four of those questions in your mind as I am reading. Don't just all wave it off and say, oh, you know, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace, so therefore I don't have to worry about that. And so I can just ignore that entire chapter. So why did God leave it in the Bible? God has a purpose in it, even if you're not under the law, but under grace. He has a purpose for you in it. So ask those four questions. Does it apply directly to me? Does this establish a principle that applies to me? Does this give an illustration that provides guidance for me? Does this show a difference between Israel and the church? Now, if I were a betting man, which I am not, I don't at all, I would be willing, though, if I were a betting man, to wager that it's probably been a long period of time since you studied Leviticus 11 in any detail, if you've ever even done so. So I'm going to read the passage starting in verse 3. Listen to this. It's serious, too, because there were some serious penalties if you violated this chapter. Some very serious penalties, some of which included death. That's fairly serious. There were some that were milder. You would be unclean until evening. But there were some very serious penalties for some of this. Beginning in verse 3. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and showeth the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. So, just sort of as a warm-up, think about cows and horses. You know, the, the cow has a cloven foot, and it chews the cud. How about the horse? It chews the cud, too. But... It doesn't have a cloven hoof. If you've ever seen a, a horseshoe, you know that. But you know the French eat horses. Hey, that's their thing. They've been doing it for centuries. Verse 4. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean to you. Now all across the Middle East, there are many people that eat camels. You can buy strips of camel meat hanging in the markets in a lot of North African countries. They raise them and eat them. And they do divide the hoof just like a cow does, but, you know, it says, He divideth not the hoof, but he chews the cud. He's unclean to you. And the coney, verse 5. Now, a coney is a rock hyrax. Question. Do you even know what a rock hyrax is? 
Do you have any idea what a rock hyrax looks like? You can't eat the coney because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean to you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. See, why does God care about what's in the mouth and what's on the end of their feet? I mean, how does he make a distinction between animals based on what they're doing with their mouth? Do they just sort of leave their mouth in one position or do they go like this all day long? And then what does that have to do with their feet? God's making rules. It might seem arbitrary to you. Does God have the right to make a rule that may seem arbitrary to you? Yes. If he makes the rule and it seems arbitrary to you, if you were obligated to obey that rule, would you have to obey it, even if it seemed arbitrary? Yes. Obey first, understand later. Very important principle of the Christian life. Verse 6, And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean unto you. Question, have you ever eaten bacon, ham, pork sausage? If you're from the south, have you ever eaten hog jowl, or hog jowls, or pork rind, or chitlins? <laughs> Verse 8, Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcasses shall ye not touch. Have you ever touched a part of one of these dead animals? I mean, hey, the last time that you pulled out some bacon, you say, well, I wasn't eating it myself, but, you know, I cooked it for somebody else who thought it was okay to eat bacon. Did you touch the bacon? That's part of a dead animal. It's part of a dead pig. It says, their carcasses shall ye not touch. They are unclean unto you. Now, as we're going through this, I hope you're trying to answer the four questions rather than just glibly saying, man, I'm glad we're not under the law. Verse 9. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. So it's both salt water and fresh water creatures. And all that have not fins and scales in the sea and in the rivers, and of all that move in the waters, and of any living thing which is in the waters, even some things that don't move are living things in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. Have you ever eaten eel? Have you ever eaten shark? Have you ever eaten shrimp? Have you ever eaten oysters? Have you ever eaten scallops? Hey, some of those are delicious things to eat. I know some people have a, a real, you know, deep yearning to have some of those things. Maybe some of you are getting hungry as I talk about oysters and shrimp and scallops. Maybe not in talking about eel, but you know, eel's pretty good too. <laughs> and shark. I've had shark. I've eaten mako shark. Verse 11. They shall be an abomination unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Hey, now let me stop for a moment. There are several words translated abomination uh, in the Old Testament. The word abomination here is the Hebrew word shakaz. means filthy, loathful, polluted, detestable in the eyes of God. That word abomination that's used here is the root word for shaketz. The word for used for an idolatrous abomination. That's the word that God uses if you eat any of those things. And if that's a prohibition that is directed toward you, it puts you in the same category as those who worship abominable idols. Does God use some language here that indicates what he thinks about it? And we talked about idolatry this morning. Verse 12. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination to you. And these are they which you shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten, they are an abomination. The eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl and the nighthawk and the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl and the swan and the pelican and the gear eagle and the stork and the heron after her kind and the lapwing and the bat. Question. Do you even have any idea what in the world is an ossifrage, or comorant, 
or a gear eagle? What in the world is a lapwing? So how would you know if you ever ate one accidentally? Remember, folks, these were serious commands that were punishable by serious penalties. So do they apply to you or do they not? And if so, why or why not? Can you give specific reasons why they don't apply to you? Biblical reasons. Can you prove your position from Scripture if you're serious about knowing and obeying the will of God? Don't just say we're not under the law. That's true. But do you even know the references that prove you are not under the law? You've all heard me preach that we're not under the law. You've all been raised to believe, more or less, that we're not under the law, though some in Reformed circles really try to put you under the law and they tell you that the Ten Commandments are God's guide for the Christian life. That's a weak one. Do you even know where the New Testament says that you're not under the law? Can you tell me the books in which the New Testament tells you that you are not under the law? What are the two principal books of the New Testament that make it clear you are not under the law? Do you know what they are? I hope you said Romans and Galatians. Those are the two principal books in the New Testament, and there are many other places as well, but two places, two principal books in the New Testament that tell you you're not under the law. Let me read a couple of verses. Romans 6.14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. It's not an excuse to sin just because you're not under the law. Galatians chapter 3. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. In other words, a change took place, and Paul spends three chapters dealing with that. Chapter 4, verse 21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Chapter 5, But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. You can't get any more plain than that especially in the context of those three chapters, 3, 4, and 5 in the book of Galatians. Now, let's back up for a second. The law said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Does not being under the law make it okay to commit adultery? Can you tell me why or why not? Can you point to specific passages that would indicate why or why not? Can you prove it from Scripture? You can prove now you're not under the law. Can you prove that not being under the law doesn't give you permission to go out and commit adultery? Let me ask this. Why is eating a lapwing different than committing adultery or murder or stealing? Why? Can you tell me why it's different? Both of those things were contained in the law. I hope you've been asking yourselves the four questions as I've been covering the material and that you can prove your answers from Scripture because knowing and doing the will of God depends on being able to do this. Remember the four questions again. Number one, does it directly apply to me? Number two, does this establish a principle that applies to me? Number three, does this give an illustration that provides guidance for me? And number four, does this show a difference between Israel and the church? I hope you're beginning to understand, and you've heard me preach this over and over. Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. You know, that is a question that is muddy waters in Reformed theology. Only the Bible Presbyterians take a stand that says that Israel still has national promises given by God. All the rest of them allegorize, mythologize, and turn aside the promises of God for Israel and just apply them lump sum over to the church. And as a result, they've got all kinds of problems with the law. Let's go on to the passage. Verse 20. All fowls that creep, going upon all four, shall be an abomination unto you. Did you know that some fowls creep upon four limbs? Can you list them? 
Yet these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet, or to leap withal upon the earth. Even these of them ye may eat. Get ready with your knife and fork. The locust after his kind. The bold locust after his kind. The beetle after his kind. When was the last time you ate a beetle? <laughs> and the grasshopper after his kind. We all eat pork and ham and bacon and all that kind of stuff. And this passage says you can't eat that. But it says you can have all the locusts and grasshoppers and beetles that you want. <laughs> Folks, did you ever study Leviticus 11? Maybe you read through it and you read through the Bible in a year and you zipped through that passage and read it as fast as you could and didn't make any sense to you and so you just, you know, checked it off, you read it through, you at least let those words go through your eyes and out your mind as fast as they could. But all other creeping, flying creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. And for these ye shall be unclean. Whosoever touches the carcass of them shall be unclean until the evening. Have you killed any bugs recently and accidentally touched them or swept up some dead cockroaches off the floor? You know, I, I smack clothing moths all the time between my palms. I smush them with my thumb on the wall when they land. A year ago, we got, I have no idea where, we got an infestation of moths, little teeny weeny moths. And for a while, there were literally hundreds of them in the manse. And I hung up fly strips all over the place. And I mean, one of those things landed on the fly strips, they couldn't get away. And the fly strips would be completely covered with moths. And I'd go around, and they're really hard to catch like this because they zigzag like that. But, it, you know, I've gotten pretty good at it. And I occasionally kill a few, you know, still. I've gotten rid of most of them. I've recently gotten, and this is a wonderful tool if you don't have it for $2.39 at Harbor Freight Tools. A thing that looks like a, a tennis racket, but it has a DC electric current in it and real close webbing. <laughs> and if you push the button and just touch the thing, it goes zzz, you hear this little zits, and you can see the little flash of light up there and the moth is dead. And as long as you hold the button, the moth get, is stuck to it. Then you just turn it upside down, release the button, and the moth drops into the trash can. Wonderful invention if you don't have one. It kills moths and kills flies and it kills wasps and hornets and those wood-boring bees and everything else that flies around that you don't like. But you know it says anybody that touches the carcass of one of those things shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the eve at verse 25. The carcass of every beast which divideth the hoof and is not cloven-footed, nor cheweth the cut are unclean unto you. Everyone that toucheth them shall be unclean. And whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean unto you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until the even. Have you ever touched your dead dog or dead cat when it died? He that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes. You felt so sorry and you picked up that poor dog that you loved, you know, and you hugged it and then you went out and buried it in the backyard and put up a little stone to mark the grave or your dead parakeet or whatever you had. He that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. They are unclean unto you. These also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind. Did you ever pick up a tortoise or a turtle when you were a kid in school? And the ferret and the chameleon and the lizard and the snail and the mole. You know, almost every non-Jewish boy alive has picked up lizards and snails. Even some girls, although most of the time they squeal and they run away, which is what makes them so fun to pick up for the boys and hold them up in front of the girls. These are unclean to you among all that creepeth, whosoever doth touch them. When they be dead shall be unclean until the evening. Do you realize God gave a whole chapter of the Bible to this? And it's not a short chapter. And upon whatsoever any of them when they are dead doth fall, it shall be unclean. Whether it be a vessel of wood or raiment or skin or sack, whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put into water and it shall be unclean until the evening, so it shall be cleansed. Got to soak it until night. You know, 
Some bug dies and it falls on top of one of your pots. Cockroach dies and, you know, inside your shoe. Soak your shoes. Every earthen vessel wherein to any of them falleth, whatsoever is in it shall be unclean, and ye shall break it. Pottery couldn't just be cleaned, it had to be broken. Of all meat which may be eaten, on that on which such water shall cometh shall be unclean, and all that drink that may be drunk in every such vessel shall be unclean. Got to throw it out. Everything whereon any part of their carcass falleth shall be unclean, whether it be the oven or ranges or pots, they shall be broken down. Imagine that. Some unclean thing falls on your oven, and you've just had a had the local mason come in and build you a brand new nice oven in your house there in ancient Israel and some raven flies through gags on the smoke and dies on top of your oven you know what you gotta do? you gotta break it up Everything whereon any part of their carcass shall be shall fall, shall be unclean, whether it be the oven, the ranges, or the pots, for they shall be broken down, for they are unclean, and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a fountain or a pit wherein there is plenty of water shall be clean, but that which toucheth their carcass shall be unclean. And if any part of their carcass fall upon any sowing seed which is to be shown, it shall be clean. But if any water be put upon the seed, and any part of their carcass fall thereon, it shall be unclean unto you. Was God giving some rather detailed instructions here? Is the seed dry or is it wet when the dead thing falls on it? And if any beast of which ye may eat die, he that toucheth the carcass thereof shall be unclean until the even. And he that eateth of the carcass of it shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. He also that beareth the carcass of it shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. They did a lot of laundry. And every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth shall be an abomination, it shall not be eaten. Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and whatsoever goeth upon all four, or whatsoever hath more feet, among all creeping things, think millipedes and centipedes, that creepeth upon the earth, them ye shall not eat, for they are an abomination. Now I want you to stop and think for a second. God created all of those creatures. And at creation, what did God say about them? God pronounced every one of these creatures that he has called an abomination and unclean. At creation, God pronounced every one of them good. But sin entered into the world. And the law was given because of sin. And so now God has, under the law, has given those creatures a different status, a new status under the law. Are you thinking in context of the entire scripture? What God is trying to teach us through that, none of those things were considered unclean back in the days of Adam and Eve before the fall. Verse 43, Ye shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them, that you should be defiled thereby. Look at the language that God uses. For I, the Lord, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the beasts, and of the fowl, and of every living creature that moveth in the waters, and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Now, have you been asking yourself the four questions as we've been going through this? I hope so. I hope you know how to answer that from the New Testament because those four questions are specifically answered in the New Testament concerning that entire chapter that we just read in Leviticus chapter 11. You don't have to look very far either in the New Testament to see that the list does not apply to you. Let me just read you a few verses. Here we are, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 4 beginning in verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, in other words, God is not going to leave this as an area of wonderment to the Christians scratching their heads and saying, 
Hmm, which part of this applies to me? Can I eat the lap wing, but I can't eat the gear eagle? Hmm, let's see. wonder what a lap wing is. Let's go out and see if we can find one at the store. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. God is giving us clear detail here. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Ooh, this is rather heavy that we're getting into here. It's a departure from the faith. And what he's about to discuss is demonic doctrine. You better know how to answer the questions that we've just asked, those four questions in relation to Leviticus 11 and many different other places in the Old Testament. Because otherwise you may find yourself being subject to the doctrines of devils, that's demons. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Whoa, what's being taught? will be a lie and if you buy into it you're in serious trouble all lies are from the devil having their conscience seared with a hot iron the people that do this know the difference but they have seared their conscience so it no longer has feeling in it interesting listen to verse 3 forbidding to marry commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created, takes you back to creation, takes you back before the law, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now here's your key verse. Here is what deals with Leviticus chapter 11. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Every creature of God is good. Nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Why do you pray before your meals? You know, it goes back to verses like this. So now you can feel free to go out and eat a mole or a mouse or a lapwing <laughs> or a gear eagle. You're not required to. But you understand that as we move into this incredible dispensation of grace, why we are not under the law, here we see it in relation to food. Now, there are other things that were not under the law in relation to, like all the ritual ceremonies, but you've got to know the verses where it says so. I'm just dealing with one area and those four questions. Each different area of your study of Scripture, you should be asking those four questions if you want to understand, does it apply to me? Or am I supposed to learn a principle about something here? So why is Leviticus in the Bible? Well, let me read the rest of the chapter here in 1 Timothy, the rest of two verses. For sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm teaching you this. Because Paul says to Timothy, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So, why is this list in Leviticus still in our Bible? What does it have to do with us today? It's a practical, visible illustration of the Bible doctrine of separation. You've got it up there on the, the platform behind me. Be ye separate. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. It is the principle of God making his people separate and distinct and different from the world around us. It also shows a clear distinction between Israel and the church. We are to be different from the rest of the world, though the differences in the church relate to other things. You know, I hope you picked it up as we were reading through the last part of that passage. There was a key verse in that passage in Leviticus that gave the correct trans-dispensational principle Two verses, verse 44 and verse 45. 
For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. To sanctify means to be set apart or to be separate. You shall sanctify yourselves and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. God said this is the way that you as Jews are supposed to show that you have a different kind of a God than everybody else around you. That's what God gave to Israel as one of the external signs that showed that they were different. To be your God, you shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Does holiness apply to us? Does God tell us to be holy, for he is holy? Yes. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Be separate, be sanctified, be set apart. That moves us to the next question, which we are over time already, which is the will of God and our motivation. We have to ask the next question. We're going to take this up next week. But the next question is, why am I doing what I am doing? You see, the will of God includes the reasons that we do what we do. But we'll pick that up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your will and for the way in which you have revealed it to us in your word. Help us not to be sloppy Bible scholars. Help us not to be slothful in our study. Help us not just to sort of generalize and say, oh, well, that's the law. I don't have to worry about that. You gave it so that you could teach some very important principles. You gave it so that you could teach some distinctions between Israel and the church. That the church is not Israel. That Israel is not the church. You gave it so that we might understand your character and your nature. You gave it to give illustrations in the physical realm of certain things that you now want us to understand and apply in the spiritual realm. Father, we pray that you might help us to be faithful and diligent in our study of the scriptures, that we might be like the Bereans, searching the scriptures daily, whether these things are so. And Father, once again, we pray that you will take the word of God as it has been expounded tonight Use it, apply it to our hearts, that we might live with joy in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Walking in ways that are pleasing to you, not because of the law, but because of the love that we have for Christ. The internal indwelling of the Holy Spirit and his empowerment to do what is pleasing to you, which we cannot do in the flesh. And that it might all be for the glory of God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.